What if I told you guys that Friedrich Nietzsche, a modern philosopher, showed me how to dance? What if I told you that Aristotle, an ancient thinker, taught me how to have better relationships with my friends, with my family, my romantic relationship, and even with strangers? What if I told you that I learned the most important lessons of my life studying the history of philosophy, and better yet, what if I told you that the greatest lessons you have learned in your lives have been shaped by this exact same history? Whether it's with your work, the productive work that you do, the day-to-day, -day, your career, whether it's your view of money, of investment, savings, your appreciation of art, your love of music, the self-esteem that you have, the confidence that you have, and even the sex that you have, have all been shaped by this exact same history. And what I want to do today is talk about what this history is and give you some framework of starting to think about how we can approach it. I'm then going to talk about why I think it's a tool for flourishing and why I think you should study it, why you should undertake this journey. And then I'm going to share with you a couple of lessons, a couple of insights that I have learned and implemented in my own life from this history, from specific thinkers, and hopefully give you some practicable tips that you can take away and implement into your lives today in order to live a better life. So, First thing, the history of philosophy is a history. And much like any other, it's a study of the past. But unlike any other, it's also a study of the present. The by studying the history of philosophy, you will learn how you should orient yourself in this life today. What actions and choices should you make? Ways of thinking that you should adopt today. And better yet, you will learn about yourself. So it's not only a study of the past, and it's not only a study of the present, but it's also a study of yourself. The history of philosophy is necessarily an introspective journey. Because when you encounter the thinkers, the ideas, they necessarily, or you necessarily, have a self-reflective experience. And let me tell you what I mean by that. So this history is comprised of two things, thinkers and their thoughts. Let's talk about each one independently. Start with the thinkers. By undertaking this journey, you will have a unique opportunity to peer into the windows of the minds of the most fascinating characters. You will have the opportunity to see the inner workings, the thought processes, the peculiarities of the most interesting, intelligent, sharp, witty, funny, unusual, peculiar geniuses in the history of the world. Aristotle has this quote. I mentioned him. He's an ancient Greek philosopher. He said that no great genius has ever been born without a touch of madness. And perhaps there is no other history more saturated with geniuses than the history of philosophy. And there's sure as hell a lot of madness. Let me give you a bit of a teaser as to the type of characters you can expect to meet. You're going to come across thinkers who cried and stamped their foot at the world because two plus two equals four. You're going to come across thinkers that literally thought that they were gods. One of them even jumped into a volcano to prove this point. Of course, he proved a different point. <laughs> Another one lived in a barrel. Another one slept in ovens. And many, many of them refused to eat beans because they claimed they looked like testicles. So when I say these characters are fascinating, I mean it. And when you peer into the windows of their minds, you will also see your own reflection, exposing your own thought processes and our own peculiarities. Now, of course, these thinkers, as interesting and, and worthwhile pursuing on their own as they are, 
would be nothing if not for their thoughts. And the thoughts that they had are the most powerful thoughts that anyone has ever had in history. These are the thoughts that move individuals, cultures, societies, nations, and history itself. The thoughts that they have had are what get us up in the morning. If you're motivated by ambition, if it's the desire to go out and make something of yourself, well, you've been shaped by Aristotle and Nietzsche and Rand. If it's your faith, Aquinas, Ibn Rushd, if it's fear or anxiety even, Kierkegaard, Sartre, and whether you know it or not, this history plays more of a role in your life than you might think. And it doesn't matter where you come from. I know there are many different countries from which you all come from, but one thing that unites you all is that no matter where you're from, no matter what culture you live in, and no matter what are the dominant ideas that surround you, you will be able to trace back those ideas to this exact same history. I know there's a lot of Brazilians here. Where are you guys? Okay, over there. Perfect. So, I looked up the Brazilian flag, order and progress. Does anyone know which philosopher or philosophy that comes from? Positivism, August Comte, uh, the father of positivism, which uh, sounds more positive than it actually is. He's also the father of altruism. And the point being is that sometimes there are, of course, all the Brazilians knew that, but I don't know if anyone else did. <laughs> but sometimes uh, there are these tiny threads into this history that we might not know of. And Brazil is just one example. No matter which country you come from, you will be able to connect the dominant ideas of your culture to this history. But of course, this particular view of history, this particular view of what moves individuals, what moves societies, what moves cultures, is certainly not the dominant view. And I realized this when I was in university. So as Craig mentioned, I studied economics. And I remember we had a lesson on the British Industrial Revolution. And one of the slides was titled The Seven Causes of the British Industrial Revolution. And seven causes is enough to just blow your mind any, in any way, but nevertheless. And I remember the number one cause. Can anyone guess? Any idea what that might be, given the direction I'm going in? I heard a noise. Okay, it's not that. A high agricultural yield. And of course, the other six were two material causes. And I thought to myself, I'm certain all of these things contributed to the British Industrial Revolution. I'm certain. But are they primaries? Like, is that literally the most fundamental cause of the British Industrial Revolution? Now, I asked AI to design a slide for me based on this interpretation of history in, in this particular context. And I wasn't going to use it at first, but I'm going to show it to you now. And the reason why I wasn't going to use it is because it's absurd. It's ridiculous. But then I realized I have to use it because it's ridiculous. This, <laughs> this is what brought about the Industrial Revolution. The wheat will create industry. The wheat will build factories. The wheat will bring about revolution. And if you pay attention, what don't you see? No people. Yeah, there's no people, there's no minds, there's no thinking, there's no productive work, but you don't need it because there's wheat. <laughs> and I remember in that class, I put my hand up and I asked my professor, do you think maybe ideas could have had something to do with this revolution? Like, how does wheat come up? Or how does a high agricultural yield of wheat come about? Are there better technologies, better systems of organization? And if so, how do they come about? Do they just magically happen? And he kind of brushed me off as if I'm stating something that's just unbelievable or like incomprehensibly stupid. And I realized that this is the dominant interpretation of 
history, of our culture, and of us as individuals. It's this kind of quasi-Marxist interpretation of the world, where it's material causes that determine outcomes. Material causes that will determine your life, our life, society's trajectory, and the movement of history. And the way I like to think of this is almost in an analogy to a butterfly effect. So the butterfly effect is, you know, this theory that a butterfly can flap its wings in Cambodia and suddenly there'll be a hurricane in the United States. Well, there's kind of this interpretation of history where there'll be a surprisingly high agricultural yield in Britain and then somehow skyscrapers in New York City. Now, this particular point that I'm making can be developed into a series of talks. And I'm happy to elaborate on anything that I've said here in the Q&A. But as you've noticed by now, of course, I don't accept this interpretation of history. However, I do think there is a valid use to the butterfly effect analogy. Because I think, in this sense, ideas are very much like butterflies. Some are beautiful. Some enhance our lives. Some are good for nature, good for our nature. Some are seductive. Some are ugly, poisonous, dangerous, and some could even kill you. And I find it quite unbelievable that a butterfly in 18th century Germany can cause a hurricane in 20th century concentration camps. I'll give you an example. Hitler carried around a single book in his pocket throughout World War I, wouldn't go anywhere without this book, in the trenches. That was Schopenhauer. Triumph of the Will, the greatest Nazi propaganda film, could might as well just be taken out straight of the Romanticist movement playbook. But to that same extent, it's also quite unbelievable that a, a thinker or a collection of thinkers can flap their wings and bring about a renaissance. It's quite amazing. And when I first fully understood this, it kind of blew my mind. How insane is it? Like, literally, how insane? It's practically incomprehensible that a single thinker can have an idea, write it down, and a hundred million people die. You're all familiar with Marx. So these are the most powerful butterflies in the world. These are the most powerful butterflies that have ever existed. And if all that, the thinkers, the most powerful butterflies, is not enough to entice you to want to undertake this journey, let me give you a few more reasons why I think you should study the history of philosophy. Who here has read some philosophy, some philosopher, but hasn't necessarily studied the entire history? Maybe by a show of hands or something, or some noise. Yeah, perfect, okay. Well, pretty much everyone. I think you can gain so much value by doing so. You can gain so much value by studying each individual butterfly, each individual thinker, each individual philosophy. And it can certainly enhance your life. But if you're going to fully appreciate any particular philosopher, any particular idea, any particular system of ideas, you need not only to know their history, but to see how they fit in to the greater picture. And if you look at them out of context, you can't really appreciate the contrast between the dark and the light, the blue and the red, the different sizes. And the history of philosophy is one where the whole is greater than the sum of its parts, because the whole illuminates each particular part, and vice versa. And I mentioned how these ideas are the ones that we, the ideas in this history, some of them, we already hold. And I think everyone here has gone through a process of analyzing different ideas 
accepting ones that they deem to be good, deem to be true, and rejecting others they deem to be false and bad. And I want to emphasize that that is a momentous achievement. To accept good ideas and to reject bad ideas is an incredible achievement. And it's something that shouldn't be taken lightly. Sometimes I'll have conversations with people and I'll make some point that to them seems so obvious it's not even worth mentioning. You know, I might say something like, if you go by reason, if you use logic and apply that throughout your life, you'll be able to live a better one, you'll be able to create a future that you want, to orient yourself with, say, values that are aligned with your purpose. And they will say, they, will, they might respond with something along the lines of, yeah, obviously. Who's going to deny that? Well, many people, many people have denied just that and continue to do so. And it's only when you see how these ideas fit into this history and this greater picture that you can appreciate each individual one and, and really appreciate what a momentous achievement it is to accept good ideas and reject bad ones. Now, another way to think of this history is also as a story. It's not just the history of philosophy, it's also the story of philosophy, and it's perhaps the greatest story ever told, and maybe even the most logical story ever told. And much like every other story, you need to start at the beginning. No one would pick up a novel, open it at some random page, and then start reading from there. You'd miss out the whole context. No one puts on a Netflix movie, fast forwards to minute 50, and then press a play. You'd have to be a psychopath. And much like you wouldn't do that, you need to start at the beginning. But the interesting thing about this particular story is that even if you don't, you'll be led there nonetheless. Because if you were to pick up this book and open it near the present end, and say you come across the postmodernists, and we've all heard of the postmodernists, and whether you appreciate them, whether you like them, whether you like some of their ideas, or whether you find them as an intellectual adversary, an enemy perhaps, if you're going to fully understand postmodernism, eventually you'll be led to the father of postmodernism, and you need to understand Nietzsche. But if you're going to understand Nietzsche, you need to know the culture against which he is responding. You need to understand Christian theology and Christian morality in particular. But if you're going to understand Christian morality, you need to know Augustine. And if you're going to understand Augustine, you need to know the philosophy on which his theology rests. And if you're going to know Plotinus and Plato, you need to know the world that they inherited and when trying to systematize into a coherent whole, and you're already at, back at the beginning of philosophy. And the same goes whether you're into existentialism, feminism, conservatism, wokeness, or what have you. They say all roads lead to Rome. Well, all ideas lead to Athens. Now, Athens is a long way away, literally, but also not literally. 2,600 years away. And this history is long, this story is long, and there are many thinkers, and there are many ideas, but you don't need to study them all. And I think the best way to approach the history of philosophy, or to start or undertake this journey for the first time, is to focus on the essential threads. And You've all been given USB sticks with an essentialized course on the history of philosophy. That is a fantastic starting point because you need a guide to take you through this story. Now, if you are interested in supplementary material, other courses on the history of philosophy, book recommendations of the entire thing, anthologies, any particular philosophy, thinker, or error, feel free to ask me about it in the Q&A. Now, when you do undertake this journey, when you do read this story, 
you study this history, no matter where your starting point, you are going to come across some enemies. You're going to come across some ideas, some thinkers, some schools that you disagree with. Sometimes, these enemies are friendlier than you might think. It's very often good to change our minds. I know we live in a society today where everyone has very fixed views, and if you diverge slightly, you, know, you might get cancelled. But one thing you learn from the history of philosophy, and one thing you learn by studying the philosophers, is that sometimes they change their minds too. Like philosophy is hard. And it's not a negative thing to reject previously, to previously held ideas that you now deem negative, false, bad. But don't be disheartened, because you'll also come across some friends, no matter what your starting point is today. Yesterday, we heard from a subjectivist, you know, someone who thinks we can know a lot of things, but nothing with 100% certainty, and maybe even thinks that that is a path towards, towards happiness, contentment. You know, if, if we don't have to know things, maybe that's a way to live a better life. Well, he has a friend in Pyro, well, we all know that person. You know, we have that crazy friend that thinks we're stuck in the matrix and only an enlightened few can escape. They have a friend in Plato. Or if you think that there is some path that you're destined to go on, there's some life outcome that you're fated to end up in, you have a friend in the Stoics. You're going to come across a lot of friends. And what I want to do now is I want to transition to the final part of my talk, and tell you a little bit about how my life has improved since I've made these friends. <laughs> but before I do that, I'm going to share a couple of... Uh, yeah, sorry. Uh, I'm going to share a couple of... Um, I guess a preamble before I, I share these two insights with you, two lessons that I've learned. First, there are so many lessons, as I said, that I have learned, so many insights that I've had studying this history that I couldn't fit them into an, an entire series of lectures, let alone a single talk. So I've chosen two that I think we can then learn from and take away a practicable, implementable tip today. And secondly, although I'm attributing each lesson to a particular thinker, it's very rare to come across an insight, a lesson that you learn, that you can attribute wholeheartedly and solely to one thinker, because you'll find that they have very different ideas, very different ways of thinking about things, but they shine a light from different angles and illuminate these lessons and insights that we have. So the first lesson I want to share with you guys is from a thinker that I've already mentioned. It's from Aristotle. Aristotle is an ancient Greek philosopher. Aristotle is perhaps the greatest philosopher of all time, one of my favorites for sure, dear friend. And Aristotle is the father of logic. He's the father of science. He's been deemed in the history of philosophy as the master of those who know. What an incredible title. And he's also the father of self-help. Because Aristotle was the first to recognize the importance of habit formation. He understood that we are habitual creatures. And that no matter how small or seemingly small and seemingly insignificant a particular habit, action, choice of words, phrases, mannerisms that we take, they become part of who we are. And eventually, they accumulate, and they have more of an impact than you might think. What Aristotle taught me is to pay attention to the tiny, pay attention to the actions, choice of words, mannerisms, facial expressions, hand gestures, body language, noises that I make, no matter how seemingly small. Of course, this isn't something you can do all the time, but some of the time, 
you ought to be conscious about your entire being. A sigh. Ah. You sit down and you sigh. And you don't even think about it. It's an automated habit. It's totally subconscious and it's meaningless. It means nothing. And yet it might be interpreted by a friend, a loved one, family member, as a sign of frustration, of boredom. And you want to be conscious of everything that you do and ask yourself, does this serve the purpose I want it to serve? Because otherwise, it will eventually become much more impactful and a barrier to communication, a barrier in your relationship. Relationships rest on one fundamental pillar, effective communication. And it's for this reason that you want to be self-critical about your communicative habits. I'll give you an example from my own personal life. So, my girlfriend and I often talk about Aristotle. In fact, he kind of joins the conversations here and there. And, you know, funnily enough, a few months ago, we were talking about something, and uh, I, I brought in Aristotle because, you know, he had something to say. And my girlfriend was telling me, Eli, you've got to stop doing this. I feel like I'm bloody dating Aristotle by now. <laughs> but, of course, I took that as a compliment and doubled down. But anyway. <laughs> okay. So, my girlfriend and I realized that... If our habits, tiny choices of words, the, our mannerisms, the way we behave, are that important, maybe it's important that we have a strategy for when we're least conscious of these things. And we decided we're going to develop a fighting strategy. We're going to develop a plan for arguing, because it's going to happen. Everyone fights, everyone argues, and when you do, very often, you are in an, in an emotional state, a high emotional state, and you do things that you don't mean, you say things that you don't mean, and they just come out sometimes. And it's kind of like going to war. You want to prepare for it. What we decided that we're going to do in this strategy is ensure that we never use negative words towards one another when in argument. And not only will we not use negative words, like swear words, but we will try to use positive words, especially in times of argument, like, you know, my love, honey, baby, what have you. Because what we learned from Aristotle is that although the arguments are not going to last, the way we treat each other is the way we think about each other, the words that we use towards each other are going to last. And one thing we found is that when you do implement this, arguments become, in a sense, easier. And also, you notice that your communication is better. Because if you want to say to your partner, you know, you're being an idiot, you can't. And then you're kind of stumped because you're like, oh, what do I say? And then you have to say you're being inconsiderate. I don't like that you said this thing or did that thing. And you'll notice that swear words or negative words are often a barrier to communication, but they just become ingrained habits. You know, your partner does something and you're like, oh, you idiot, or what have you. But if you ingrain these positive habits in your communication, it doesn't just have to be in your romantic communication. It can be with friends, family, and even with strangers. I guarantee your relationships will improve. So, here's a practicable tip that you can implement in your lives today. In fact, right now, and hopefully for the rest of the day and maybe a few more days thereafter, pay attention to your choice of words, pay attention to the phrases you use, pay attention to your hand gestures, your facial expressions, noises you make, mannerisms, body language. And ask yourself, did I consciously will this? This thing that I just did, did I consciously will this? And does it serve my purpose? 
And you'll find, more often than not, there are these ingrained habits or habits that we have ingrained into us that come as a barrier to communication. And it's fine if you find these things because it's good. It's an ongoing process of change. You know, if, if one were to ask me, do you feel like you are conscious of everything that you do and you've eliminated all of these ingrained negative habits? I'm working on it. It's not yes, it's not no. I'm working on it. And Aristotle is truly the master of the art of living consciously. And there is so much that we can learn from him. But what's beautiful about the lessons that I learned from Aristotle is that I learned to appreciate them far more by being able to contrast them to Plato. Aristotle taught me that I can take control over my own life, that I can create my own character and the master of my destiny. I can improve my relationships, I can improve my character and my life. Plato told me I'm determined. Plato told me I'm born the way I am and I'm just going to end up wherever I do with not much control over that particular path. So I was able to appreciate what an incredible lesson Aristotle taught me far more because I knew Plato. Now, I want to jump 22 years into the future, or post-Aristotle, to another thinker that I've already mentioned, Friedrich Nietzsche. And I mentioned how Nietzsche taught me how to dance. Now, what do I mean by this? So, Nietzsche has a quote, beautiful quote, incredibly poetic quote. And what I loved about this quote is that he's telling me something that I already knew. He's telling me something that is seemingly obvious. Again, we see this recurring theme. And yet, sometimes all it takes is for someone to put things so poetically, so beautifully, that you kind of like, wow, yeah, of course I should be doing this thing, or yeah, of course, this is so obvious. And you know what Nietzsche said to me? Nietzsche said to me, Eli, it's better to dance awkwardly than to walk lamely. Nietzsche said to me, if there is something you want to go and try, if there is something you're passionate about, some new venture you want to undertake, it's probably not going to be perfect. It's going to be rocky. You're not going to be amazing as soon as you start. And you'll probably dance a little awkwardly but it's better than walking lamely and giving up before you even try. Nietzsche told me to say yes to life. Nietzsche told me to go for it, to seize the day. I have one chance and one chance only. It's my only life, and I should make the best of it and the most of it and try to make it the happiest one that I possibly can. And I remember being in university, studied economics. You study economics, what do you go and do thereafter? You go and work in finance. But I just wasn't that interested in finance. It wasn't my passion. I didn't feel fulfillment. And I remember coming back after the summer holidays, meeting with my classmates, exchanging our, ex our work experiences, and you know, one of them interned at this bank, another one interned at this investment firm, et cetera, et cetera. And I told them I interned at a think tank. They were like, what? A think tank? What is that? That's not going to help you get anywhere. But I realized that the finance route and the particular career and path I was on, that I was walking on, was just not right for me. It had better pay and perhaps more stability, but less fulfillment for me. And I felt that I was walking lamely. And Nietzsche gave me the nudge I needed to go out and dance awkwardly, or at least attempt to. You know, I go on stage, I write, I teach, what have you, and sometimes it is awkward. And there's always, always more to improve. But it's 
better to dance awkwardly than to walk lamely. And I want to flip that on its head and pose some questions to you guys. Is there something that you guys want to do that you're hesitating undertaking this venture? Fear is holding you back. Are you guys aspiring entrepreneurs? Anyone want to start a business as an idea, but is afraid? Afraid that it's going to fail? Does anyone want to be an artist, but is afraid that their art isn't going to be liked? Or does anyone just want to take some dance lessons on the weekends, but are afraid that you're going to look silly? Well, sometimes it's better to dance awkwardly than to walk lamely. Sometimes you just got to go for it. And one thing, again, that is so incredible about this lesson is that you can only truly appreciate it in the context of Nietzsche. You know, it's, we, we hear this all the time, seize the day, carpe diem, what have you. But for Nietzsche, this was revolutionary. Because to truly appreciate and understand it, you need to know the culture that preceded him. The Christian norms of humility and modesty, and certainly not greatness. So to truly appreciate any lesson and any insight, you need to know how it fits in to this history, be able to contrast it with these other ideas. And what's interesting about Nietzsche in this particular lesson is that I don't agree with Nietzsche on practically anything fundamental. And yet, I can learn from him. It's very rare to come across any thinker, no matter whether you agree or disagree with them, from whom you can't learn something. They do exist, but there's not many. Now, I've talked about many reasons why I think the history of philosophy is a tool for flourishing. It's a fascinating story. You, it's a self-reflective journey. You'll be able to understand yourself on a much deeper level. You learn these incredible lessons and much, much more. And what I want to do to conclude is I want to essentialize all of these lessons into one single reason why I think the history of philosophy is an incredible tool for flourishing. And I'm going to tell it to you in a myth, because I think there's an ancient Greek myth that emphasizes this reason beautifully. And it's the Promethean myth. But it's not the one you might have in mind. Prometheus was a Greek titan. Titan is kind of like a god. And Prometheus is most known for being the titan that stole the fire from the gods after they had banished it from mankind and retrieved it and gave it back to mankind. He's a lover of mankind. He's a friend of mankind. You know, I mentioned friends earlier. Well, Prometheus is certainly your friend. But it's not this myth that I think emphasizes the point so beautifully. Rather, it's the Promethean creation myth. Because Prometheus had a brother. His brother's name was Epimetheus. Prometheus means foresight, the ability to foresee how things turn out. Whereas Epimetheus means hindsight. He kind of remembers things after they happen. He's kind of like a klutz. He's like, yeah, I should have known that. And you, just there, you see this contrast, which plays this theme throughout this history. Well, Epimetheus one day is tasked with the challenge of assigning different characteristics, different attributes, different faculties to the entire animal kingdom. So he gets going, and he gives this one talons, this one claws, this one venom, this one thick hide, fur, strong legs, high jump, fast speed, brute strength, and he goes on and on and on and on and on. And by the time he gets to mankind, he's left with nothing. 
He has nothing left to give. And he's stumped because he knows that if he sends man into nature as he is, thin skin, no talons, no sharp teeth, no fur to protect us, relatively weak, relatively slow, there is no chance that we would survive, let alone just live. And he's completely stumped. But fortunately, Prometheus steps in because Prometheus knows that there is a single attribute, characteristic, faculty, tool, that if given to mankind, will be able to compensate for the lack of everything else and not only enable us to survive, but to live and to thrive. And Prometheus decides to give man reason. He gives us our thinking mind, represented by fire. It's through our reason, through our mind, our conceptual faculty, that we can create fire, technology, bring about an industrial revolution. And if you think about what the true moral of this story is, our reason, our mind, is literally the equivalent of a tiger's claws, teeth, speed and strength, snakes, venom, an eagle's talons. It's our most fundamental basic tool for surviving. It's our most fundamental tool for living. Seriously try to imagine what it would be like not having this single thing. You know, I can imagine a tiger without claws, whatever, like a man with, or a human without a mind, without a reasoning mind. And unlike all of the other animals, we can actually improve and we can sharpen this tool that we have. We can sharpen this tool so then we can orient ourselves in this world, live this life in a way that is better or in a superior way. And that's why I think the history of philosophy is a tool for flourishing. Because when you undertake this history, when you go on this journey, each thinker, each idea, each philosophy that you encounter and seriously grapple with will sharpen this tool that you have, will sharpen your mind. So, if you want to flourish, if you want to live the best life that you possibly can, you want to be happy, actualize your potential, you need to sharpen this tool, you need to sharpen your mind. And perhaps, though, that perhaps there is no greater resource for doing so than the history of philosophy. So, go on this great journey, get to know yourself on a deeper level, and equip yourself with everything you need for anything that might come. Go out and dance with these butterflies. Thank you. Now, before we get to the Q&A, I just have to show you one more slide that AI designed. I just think it's too funny not to show. I wanted a slide for my final point about how the history of philosophy sharpens your mind, and this is what AI thought would be. Anyway. Yeah, sure. Hi. Uh, that was a superb, beautiful, inspiring talk. And um, you said during the talk to ask you about uh, books, anthologies, and reading to do. And I'll mention a couple that are on my own bookshelf, see if you also recommend them. Um, the History of Philosophy by W.T. Jones, uh, and also Philosophical Classics by Kaufman, which has the advantage of actually taking excerpts from 
philosophers, so you're like reading them directly rather than reading somebody else's summary or interpretation. So uh, what other books would you recommend? Are you looking for histories of philosophy or any particular thinker? Uh, just history okay, so, in general, like the whole history. Okay, so you've all been given, I think, one of the best courses on the history of philosophy. If you're looking for books, then W.T. Jones is fantastic. I haven't read Kaufman. I think a really dry run of most of the history of philosophy is also Bertrand Russell's history of philosophy, but it's only if you're really interested, because what he does is he says, here's a thinker, here's their ideas, and here's some critiques of these ideas, but it's not, it's not very motivating, there's not much passion there. If you've already studied the history of philosophy and you're familiar with technical terms, then there's also a German named Windelband. I, I think his book is out of print, but you can still get it on Amazon somehow, so I'd recommend that. And there's also a great book that isn't a history of philosophy, but it does run through the history of philosophy, drawing on a really crucial theme. It's called The Cave and the Light, and I think the, the subtitle is uh, The Battle for Western Civilization. Struggle. The Struggle for Western Civilization. Uh, and in that book, uh, the author really contrasts the two key philosophies and positions in history, which are the Platonic and the Aristotelian, and how they manifest throughout this history. So I would recommend those. Okay, thank you. Hey, uh, great talk. Um, I loved how you used the butterfly analogy to explain how big of an impact ideas can have, where they can either kill millions or produce the alternative. Now, my question for you is, what book would you keep in your back pocket to achieve the alternative? What book would I, sorry? What, was that? what book would you keep in your back pocket to achieve the alternative? To Killing millions, of mm. course. <laughs> one single book. That's a tricky one. Well, that would be one option. But I'm thinking more ancient, because a renaissance didn't come about because of that book. And I'm thinking maybe a book, perhaps uh, Aristotle's Logic. Something, perhaps something epistemological from Aristotle doing with his logic, I would say. But there are, yeah, I don't think there is a single book. I think it would have to be, uh, I'd have met too many books in my pockets to actually go and fight. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for, for the talk. Um, you mentioned the example of communicating with your girlfriend and choosing wor words and trying not to use certain words. So it brings up to mind a worry of isn't that, doesn't that put you at risk of repression, of like ignoring some emotions that you have inside? So I'm worrying, I'm, I'm, I would love to hear your thoughts about it and maybe some philosophers who talked about uh, how, not, how not to repress things. Yeah, sure, that's a good point. So I don't think it does repress because it's not as if you're saying, when I feel angry, I'm not going to address you because that's a negative thing. So I'm just going to step away and take a break, come back, and once that feeling is gone. Rather, what I'm saying is, so this fighting strategy that I mentioned, it's not a single, single uh, instruction. There's more than just that. It's also not going to bed angry with one another. It's also vowing that you are going to resolve these things and work through them. And what, what you find, or at least what I find, is that when you refuse to use these negative words, it's not that that becomes a barrier to communication, but rather, or, and perhaps starts repression, but the exact opposite. I think sometimes swear words can be repression because you're not actually communicating how you feel. You're just substituting that for some sort of emotional outburst. But instead of saying, oh, you're being an idiot, you have to actually say what is really upsetting you. You have to say, look, this thing that you said, I, I don't like that. That thing that you did, it made me feel this way. And you have to actually communicate it. So I, I definitely don't think that 
by doing so you are oppressing. Because it's not that you're it's not that you're evading an emotion that you're having. It's rather you're, you're figuring out how to deal with it in a way that is going to set up your relationship to continually improve. As for philosophers who have talked about this in particular, I can't say that I'm too familiar with. It's more of a psychological issue, and especially, I don't, I don't think many philosophers talk about the like, rom relationships and things of the sort in, in terms of romantic, uh, romantic relationships. I, I did learn a lot from psychologist Nathaniel Brandon about this, which obviously ties into the objectivist philosophy, uh, but prior to that, I'm not too familiar with this particular issue uh, being a, a philosophic one. Thank you. I do want to mention another psychologist called Marshall Rosenberg that developed a method called nonviolent communication that is really about that, about how to communicate what is alive with you, in you without being violent. And I also want to invite you and everybody else to come dance awkwardly with me tomorrow at an event called Ecstatic Dance. So if anybody, it's like really about that. Uh, so if it hits anybody in the heart, please come to me. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, first I want to say I love the AI pictures. <laughs> yeah, thanks. It takes a lot of time. And I wanted to ask um, who has inspired you in your life to delve into the world of philosophy and what made you start being interested in it? I'm going to have to expand on the story that Craig started when he introduced me. But I didn't know what philosophy was a couple, three, four years ago. I studied economics, and every time I'd pick up a philosophy book, I found it quite inaccessible. It went way over my head. The terminology was just way beyond my level of comprehension. And I really couldn't understand what the hell's going on. So I left that thing for the philosophers. And then I happened to just come across a Facebook ad for this conference, Level Up, Tells Level Up. And I clicked on it, and I saw that they give out scholarships, and you know, I decided to apply. Ended up coming to this conference, and I heard a talk about free will by Craig Biddle. And it really blew me away, because for the first time, I understood these questions, the really important questions that I had been asking myself, are actually philosophy. And I really didn't know that. And I didn't realize the connection between philosophy and my own life. And it's really by attending this conference a few years back that I, this spark was ignited, this interest, this passion for philosophy. And then since that, you've heard from Craig what I've been doing, but it's really things like this, yeah. And, and that's why, you know, it's a shame my talk is the last one, but I encourage you to engage with all the other talks, the speakers, the people around. I, you know, I came on my own, I knew no one, but by the time the conference ended, I practically knew everyone, so. Where do you... Um what do you recommend for someone like myself who's just starting to delve into philosophy and have an interest in it, and who hasn't studied it in depth before? That course you've been given on the history of philosophy is a great place to start. So uh, the history of philosophy is really long. There's a lot of thinkers. But that course is a, an essentialized course where you won't study thinkers who, you know, smaller butterflies or less significant butterflies, but you study the most important ones. So I would recommend starting there. Thank you. Hi, like, great talk, thank you. Um, you mentioned before the cave and the light. I was also curious uh, on your view, uh, what are your thoughts on Thomas Sowell's conflict of visions, and if you think that that explains how those different and conscious visions uh, go throughout history and uh, philosophers fit into that. I'm not familiar with Thomas Sowell's conflict of visions. Um, um, so if you want to, in one sentence, okay, yeah. explain it to me. Mm, I I'll, I'll think I'll, maybe you have to go and, and have a We can talk about it later yeah. then. Oh, okay, I don't no want to take too much time off the others, but okay. yeah, thank you. Okay, uh, hi, thank you for the talk. Um, well, as I read uh, more and more, I see my ideas as a puzzle, uh, constructed with different outdoor stories and opinions. And I always thought that I can take different contributions and like, create my, my own, and, but I don't know how to start or how to organize the different um, areas of thinking, and I would like uh, an advice or a recommendation on how to 
on what to focus in in this in this idea I have. So let me just see if I got the question right. You're just now delving into philosophy, and you're seeing loads of different paths, loads of different ideas, but they seem discombobulated, and you want to organize them into some sort of system exactly. and framework of viewing ideas. Yeah. So the first thing you need to understand is that philosophy is comprised of five branches and three key branches. Exactly. That's a great way of classification. So. That's metaphysics, epistemology, ethics, politics, and aesthetics. So would you recommend the Aaron system? Who? Aaron system. To understand? Yeah. So I'm, I'm, I, I don't think I understood the question. Ayn Rand system. Oh, no, that's not Ayn Rand system. That's just general classification of philosophy. These are the okay. five branches of philosophy. Okay. Metaphysics, epistemology, ethics, aesthetics, and politics. So one thing that clarified the branches in my mind more than anything else is the realization that they are dependent on one another, but not in like a skyscraper type, type of way where you know, epistemology rests on metaphysics and ethics rests on this, but rather in an X. Metaphysics and epistemology are the foundation of philosophy, and they give rise to your ethics. Mm. Now, your ethics are going to then give rise to your view of how, so your ethics, how an individual should act, gives rise to how society should be organized. And it gives rise also to the theory of aesthetics. So that's a way to classify and categorize different ideas in your own mind. Now, another way is by themes, and that's why I keep recommending this course, because, and, and the, the Cave and the Light is, is also a great book in order to understand and be able to categorize different philosophers and different ideas in certain boxes. Now, sometimes it's not great to put philosophers in different boxes, but this is a, a particular example in which it, it really is productive to do so. In the Cave of the Light, uh, the, I, I can't remember the name of the author, but what he does is he contrasts the two main approaches to philosophy. This world, this life, we can know it, we should live in it, we should try and be happy, to many worlds, other worlds, all kinds of worlds. We, we can't really know this world. We're dependent on other ones. This life isn't the most important one that we have. And we should do things in this life in order to then have a better one later. Those are the two key approaches that have persisted throughout this history. So I recommend maybe reading The Cave and the Light which I think is a really good starting point in order to find different ways or a framework of thinking of this story and being able to categorize them into different places. Okay, thank you. Wonderful talk, thank you. Thank you. Um, myself, a lot of my friends, and presumably a lot of people in this room are guilty actually of overthinking. And you said something very interesting during the Q&A of, I'd have too many books in my pockets to actually go and fight. And that cracked me up for a moment because I realized that that was part of the talk that didn't quite resonate with me because I've been stuck in the cycle of analyzing my every little movement like the sigh as I'm sitting down and instead of letting me learn, it kind of freezes me like a deer in headlights. Um, how do you avoid overthinking and getting stuck in your own head? Are there any philosophers that teach you how to act and how to take that action, though you may be unsure or afraid? Yeah, that's a, that's a really good point. And I, I, I really tried to emphasize this in my talk, but I should have clarified even more that this, this self-analysis, this process of being conscious of the smallest things that you do Something you can't do all the time. You can't do most of the time even. And you shouldn't. Like you should just live. And you shouldn't be self-critical that, to that extent 24-7. And there are times where... She, because what, what, why is, what's the purpose of doing this? It's a, to ingrain positive habits. Well, if we're going to ingrain positive habits, let's just act on these habits. Let's let them manifest. But it's important to do that every once and again so that we can inculcate those positive habits and create that character that we want to have. So I definitely agree with your point of overthinking and going through this process of self-analysis continuously. I think that's counterproductive and even harmful. 
in terms of philosophers who have discussed this exact point, again, I can't say that I'm familiar because I think this is more of a psychological issue. Philosophers tend to spend a lot of time thinking, thinking about thinking, thinking about thinking about thinking. But Aristotle, as I mentioned, the master of the art of living consciously, uh, to me, manifested himself psychologically via the psychologist Nathaniel Brandon. He has a great book called The Art of Living Consciously. And in that book, he gave me a lot of tips as to how I can implement this exact strategy and avoid the trap of overthinking. So I would recommend starting there. Thank you so much. All right, thank you very much, guys.